Okay, so we need to scale, in a scalable, scalable design, we need to scale a few things. Um, structure, electronics primarily, and also how fast you're able to, to print with it, like maybe a bigger nozzle would be another aspect that you wanna, wanna scale. So the concept, uh, let's just go to the concept first, just the main considerations. So just basics of what, what we're trying to do. So you, we, will, we have the capacity to double or multiply axi axes. We have the capacity to scale them. On the universal axis page, we actually have the, the eight millimeter version, the half inch version, which is about 13 millimeters, and the one inch version, which is 25 or so, or so millimeters. Those designs are already downloadable. And today, or, or uh, in the simplest build of up to say one meter, we're trying to push the limits of what it would take with the tiny eight millimeter rods. Because from experience, we can see that if you have a meter length, they can still hold force pretty well. If you put an extruder on top of that, it won't like sag it too much. And even if it does sag, you have the, the bed leveling correction, which corrects the bed level for wherever the, the axis, wherever the extruder is. So in theory, even if it's swooping down quite a bit, um, because the bed, bed will just simply follow it um, right, right as the print happens. So, so in principle, the eight millimeter rods are sufficient for this. And we've built a, uh, just an example of a two foot, two square foot bed kind of a printer, which is in the next room there that's well, hasn't been finished, but the structure of the rods is good enough. Now, if it isn't, we can double things up. So you can piggyback two axes together to get simply more strength. More rods means more, more strength. So you can do that. And in this initial implementation, if we were building this, we, we would try to, to just simply do a single, single pair of axes. If we found that, hey, this is maybe just wobbling, for example, too much when we actually run it. You know, you might, you'll see those kinds of things in actual physical motion. You know that at slow speed, I mean, okay, so if it does wobble, you might have to slow down the speed and then it will be totally fine. But of course, for high performance, you want to increase the speed, not decrease it in order to make this thing work. So uh, if we find inadequate performance, we would double up the axes or triple them or quadruple them. You can stack them, piggyback one on top of each other. You can stack them vertically on, on, on one, one, one another. So there's different ways you can do it. And you can do that, for example, if you have the y-axis in our normal geometry where, with, a, with a single x-axis, well, if you need more strength on an x for a really fast x, well, you could put as many of those as fit on the y-axis. You could put a couple, just like we have done on a CNC circuit mill, you can put more. You can have a space between them, maybe you have like double-double, so you got a total of four axes, or maybe <coughs> whatever, whatever you like. Or maybe put them all together in a sandwich and maybe build the, the holder for the extruder around that, so different ways. You'd like to go for symmetry, uh, because that makes for a stable form. Like humans, we're symmetric, right? <coughs> Trees are symmetric in some way. Um, Symmetry is, a, in general, a very good design principle. It makes things easy, and that's why you see it a lot in nature. Like a sun is symmetric, it's a ball, things like that. In the CNC circuit, we have two axes with a tool head in between, as opposed to maybe an axis with a tool head on the side, which then gives you other forces that you have to deal with. So symmetry, good design principle. So just like with the axes, you can scale them you will have to scale, if you have multiple axes, the little ramps board that we use cannot directly handle more than one or two motors per stepper driver. We've seen that on a, on a Z driver, you have two of them, you have two, two of the Z axes. So we already know that a single stepper driver on the board that we already use, the ramps, can handle two of the small NEMA 17 motors, okay? But we probably want more here especially for the bed. We're talking now about a one square meter bed. It starts getting into some weight. So you're going to need more stepper motors, more than the, the ramps itself can handle. So 
we can do a strategy where we use uh, simply, instead of plugging in the small Pololu stepper drivers, which require essentially two signals. One is step and the other one is direction. So step refers to how, how many turns per revolution, directions like forward or backwards. Uh, basically a couple of signals feed to the, to the stepper, well to the stepper driver and then the stepper driver feeds four wires to the actual stepper to give that sequence of pulses that magnetize the rotor in a according uh, sequence. Steel is a good deal for this. Okay, so I'll go back to the document, the one, one meter printer, it's just some of the conceptual considerations. So let's go through each element. So frame, frame build. For the scale of, of a one meter, you want to go with something like one eighth inch by two inch steel bar. Sides would be 42 inches to fit a 36 inch bed, so you want a little bit more area around the bed, first of all, to fit the bed, and then to accommodate the fact that the axes have a certain width. So about six inches on all the printers that we use right now, if you have, for example, a 14 inch frame, you can fit an eight inch bed in there, so minus six inches. So 42 minus six is 36. And do not use angle iron in this situation. We find that through experience that it's much better to weld six flat sides than lay them up into a six sided cube because of the degrees of freedom issue. When you when you put a the base, say the base face on a table, okay, you got a flat table, that thing is flat, all well constrained, and put the put the other sides next to it along the edge. So as long as you match the edges and then fold it up and weld it and they're together, you're completely constrained for how straight that thing is, assuming you've got you're starting with with flat stock, flat, straight stock, which will be quite dimensionally stable, like even the, the hot rolled steel that we use. It's a standard uh, A36 specification, standard hot rolled steel, like about 50,000 PSI strength. Uh, the accuracy is good enough for what we want to do here. Uh, the main consideration being that the axes aren't, are parallel, so that they're not locking up on you. So that's the frame build. And this can be scaled to much more, 1 8 inch for t by 2 inch steel bar for a 1 meter frame. You could do, if you got heavy machining, like more, like maybe a router structure that you'd want to do here, you'd use perhaps quarter inch by 2 inch steel bar. That could probably handle a powerful router for routing wood or something like that, which is contact machining. That could probably do that very easily. If you want to do now heavy duty CNC machining, probably have to be talking about half inch by say maybe four inch or so frame maybe even more maybe even one like welded out of even one inch by four inch I mean you can use that same kind of a design pattern if you want to build a simple cube. <coughs> otherwise we've done things like use tubing which also has good strength but out of this um, you're effectively making out of the flats you're making angles by welding two sides together at an angle is a very strong structure, structurally speaking, and altogether you have a space frame, so it's symmetric. It's closed on all sides. When you put force on one corner, actually everything connected to it withstands that force. So, uh, so you can say the force is absorbed across the entire thing because it's a closed structure, fixed, like no degrees of freedom, you, you weld it all up. Okay, so next we go to so self-aligning the corners and tack welding the six sides. Standard procedure is to tack weld it. At the level of a 3D printer, you don't need much welding. Maybe like, I mean, a couple of percent. You know, just a little tack, maybe six inches next. Tack, tack. Welds are strong. So, and we're talking about just withstanding enough, enough force to, to hold the inertia of a moving printhead. Now, also, you can be doing multiple printheads on this. So... If each print head weighs maybe like a kilogram or less, you know, if you have like two or four print heads, then according you have to withstand more force, but still like a few tack welds on a, on a frame like that is plenty for that. Uh, so here we do follow the steps similar to what we've done for the small frame, but 
we're going to support the z-axis. Now let's get to the z-axis, which is going to need more support. The plate itself for the surface is going to be quite heavy. So let's take a look at that. So, so when you do the drilling of the holes for mounting the axes, the preferred way is yes, drill the holes, mount the, mount the 3D printed pieces with a bolt, just like we did on the small frame. I did the same bolts too. Those were the 30 millimeter long M6 bolts. They, they span through the 3D printed piece and have a little bit like 5 millimeters or so, uh, maybe 10 millimeters or so left over for putting on a nut on the other side. So you got to drill those holes. For the Z-axis, you're going to drill, I would suggest starting with four support points um, on the same side. So with four point support, uh, the issue is like if you had, so let's talk about belts. We're using belt drive still. And we calculated yesterday that for a about 72 inch pound stepper motor, the force that each motor can sustain on the belt is about 20 pounds when you look at because it's at a, at a quarter inch radius as far as where the drive of the, the belt is happening. So you're multiplying that six or so pounds, inch pounds of force from the stepper motor uh, because you have a smaller radius that force actually multiplies. So you've got about 20 pounds of force on each motor. And how much do you need? Let's look at that. So whole, finishing up the whole pattern, we also mount the electronics panel. You want to mount it up because all the stepper motors are going to be towards the top because the Y stepper motors are at the top. The, you want to shorten the wiring as much as possible. So get that as close to the stepper motors as possible. The Z, Z motors are going to be at the top and it's most convenient because the Y motors are already at the top. So run all the wiring through the top, nothing on the bottom of either way. So, so you want to mount the electronics panel as high up as possible so it's simply closest. So you finish your tack welding, uh, grind and paint, drill holes. And let's look at the bed itself. So the heated bed is 36 by 36 inches. Uh, one eighth inch steel would do well, but that is very flexible. If you heat it up, it's going to start warping. So what you want to do, and you can't really see it in the picture, but weld a piece of small angle on the on the edge so that stiffens up the plate so it's so it's uh, you can't bend it anymore. If you weld a piece of angle on the on the perimeter, you can't bend it. Now the the, the middle can maybe still bend forward. So you're essentially creating an angle on the edges. But because this is a whole meter wide, every every 12 inches, or you know, maybe two more every one foot or so, do another reinforcement like So what I would probably do is do the do the reinforcement around the edge, maybe two more across. So when you have that, you cannot bend that thing. It's it's flat, as flat as the angles themselves are, which is going to be a millimeter, a few millimeters. So that's pretty good for a whole bed size. Because Marlin can co correct for a few millimeters. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you can have the bed quite skewed, and Marlin will still level it out. But that kind of flatness, it's fine to do. So then, in bed leveling, you you might probe every single foot or something like that. So probably at least you know, like one, two, three, four, maybe four by four grid of points. So you get about sixteen points for your automatic bed leveling to do the correction to correct for all the warping if you have some of that, because the first layer, depending on what size of the filament you have, the, the tolerance requirement is the thickness of that first, of what you're printing with. So if you're printing with a nozzle that's like 1.4 millimeters, you would allow up to 1.4 millimeters of unevenness on a bed surface. Well, you could, no, you could have more, more unevenness. The, the amount of correction that has to happen, it has to correct it down to 1.4 millimeters, which is quite easy, because 1.4 millimeters is uh, relatively large. Right now we're printing with 0.4 millimeter nozzles, so the you have to be you have to guess your Z offset by plus plus minus like 0.2 millimeters, which is quite fine. So that's what we're doing in an in actual practice right now. We're doing the Z Z probing, and we're observing how how far away from the bed the 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 nozzle ends up to make that correction. The larger the printer, actually the easier that is, because Marlin takes care of the rest. The larger the printer, I mean the larger the nozzle. 
the easier it becomes. So right now, the Pico print with up to, I think it's 1.4 millimeters, and I believe E3D, the company that makes the, the extruders, I believe they did recently did a 1.8 millimeter nozzle. Uh, they had the Volcano nozzle, then they came out with a Super Volcano, so they're going up in size, but that's definitely good for, um, for larger prints because the, the speed goes up as the square of the, of the size of the nozzle. Uh, the area, uh, the area cross-sectional area is as pi r squared, the larger the nozzle. So take a look at you know 0.3 of a nozzle, 0.3 millimeter versus uh, say 1.8 millimeters. That's six times. That's going to be 36 times faster. I mean, significant increase in speed. And then you can also think about putting multiple heads on on the 3D printer. And then you would have the issue, if they're all running, so you say printing like a batch of two by fours on your print bed, well, in order for the first layer to start properly, all those, say you take like four print heads, all of those would have to uh, be within that, say printing with a 1.4 millimeter, they all have to be uh, in the Z direction equivalent to within that 1.4 millimeter. So that would require another adjustment mechanism for the Z, like if you're doing multiple heads, and you probably on each head, you might want to have a little adjuster for getting that even on the first layer. Because once you start it, it all kind of evens out itself, but you have to start it on the bed, because if one is not on, or it's, if it's not on, it's going to pop off, if it's too deep, it's going to eat into your, your bed, and you're, not, you're going to clog the nozzle, because if it's riding the bed, you're pushing filament through that, the filament cannot push that, you're going to get a clog. So you have to be, be good on that. So the heated bed could be as simple as, and, and here we're talking about $5 a square foot for steel like this. If you're gonna do aluminum, that's gonna get much more expensive. So here we're going into the low cost aspect where this huge bed like that is only $50 in materials. That's excellent. I mean, otherwise you'd be paying a couple of hundred dollars, three, maybe $400, for a sheet of aluminum that would do the same. So steel is always the cheaper option for the strength. It's more accessible. But it will weigh about 50 pounds or 25 kilos. It's about five pounds per square foot with nine square feet. You've got 45 pounds right in the, in the nine, three by three, nine square feet. Then you have some extra on the lips that you're adding to it for reinforcement, about 50 pounds. So you have to hold that. We know that one motor only does 20 pounds. Two motors are 40 pounds. Two motors will not pull this up, especially if you have a large print on it. So you're gonna start with four motors where you have now 80 pounds of pull. pull. So in principle, you can, you can print something that's up to 30 kilograms, uh, 30 pounds or so. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot. Like this table here, it's probably like 20 pounds or something or 15 pounds. So you definitely wanna have enough strength. So idea would be to start with four motors and then we can keep adding more, more motors as we need because the axis you can just drill another hole, put another axis on it, but it's preferable to do it from both sides as opposed to like on all four sides because they all want to, it's easier if you have one on each side, you only have this kind of uh, unevenness possibility before you start bind, binding the belts. Now the belts are slightly flexible. It's preferable to have it on both sides because four point support it's very hard to get all the four points aligned um, on the same plane. For three points, any three points will be on the same plane. Once you get to four points, then only three points will always be on the same plane. The fourth point must be leveled, so it's much harder to support something from four sides because uh, you're going to need to drive it up. Well, the deal is with screws, like lead screws for drive. Uh, there's, if you read the internet, you'll see a lot of issues where if you have four point support on the bed, they will tend to lock up a lot because you have to be pulling exact, like, first of all, you have to have the exact uh, flat four points, which is hard to get. So you typically want to do simulate like two point or three point support so your motors don't lock up. Now, in this case, because we have belts, they have slight give, so you don't get into this lock up situation. But in some cases, uh, reading on the internet, you'll see that people who had like four, like four Z axes, they would just for all of a sudden just lock up, they wouldn't move. 
uh, and that's because of the issue of four points are very hard to get on the same plane. So uh, when we do this, we want to put all the axes uh, on the opposite ends so they act more like a two-point support. And also logistically, it's easier to run the wires that way instead of all four sides where, uh, for example, we have the control panel on one of the sides, you're not running into real estate issues uh, on the printer itself. So then uh, the PI surface, the high performance surface, we probably want to use that so that the prints stick and then pop off easily. The stock comes in one by two foot sections, so we need actually one, two, three, four and a half sections of that, which costs $162 altogether. So actually the plastic surface on top of the metal is actually more expensive than the structure itself. Now heaters. Let's see, yeah, let's talk about the heating of the bed then. So the idea here would be to use the same material that we used for the actual frame of the printer and, want, and make, turn that into heaters. So what we did on a, on a filament extruder is take a barrel, wrap it with, with Kapton tape, and then wrap 31 gauge nichrome wire around that, and then wrap it with another layer of tape, and there you have your heater. So based on the V equals IR formula, um, you get a certain amount of power feeding through this and we'd want to go at 120 volts because the, the power that we're talking about here is considerable. We talked yesterday if we scaled the same kind of 200 watts per 8, an 8 inch by 8 inch surface, 200 by 200 millimeter, um, if you do 200 watts on that then the whole 9 square foot frame would be about 5 kilowatts if we have the same scaling of power. Uh, so we're talking about a lot of energy you want to use 120 volts, otherwise the currents that there are involved would be really high and you need really thick wires. So at this point, it makes sense, a lot of sense to go into 120 or even 240 volts so that the wires you know, leading up to these nichrome heaters can be small enough, uh, small and inexpensive. Basic idea, take the flat, wrap it with nichrome tape. We got some tape that's like, I think like one inch wide wrap it so you don't have electrical contact. The, the nichrome wire is bare, it will conduct, so you have to insulate it. So what you would do is wrap it one way, a bunch of turns, figure it out through a nichrome calculator on the internet. The first page link there with the overview sheet has a nichrome calculator link. You can find out the <coughs> length of, for example, 31 gauge wire that you need to, to emit, say, 500 watts or something like that, or 200 watts. So what we might want to do to get even heating is build several of these. So we've got three feet, maybe put them every, every six inches or so. Uh, so make, what, like seven or so of these strips. Uh, each would have to be, you know, 500 watts or so, um, something to that effect. Wind it uh, when you, after you put the Kaplan tape on the bar of metal and make it three feet long, the, the whole width, length of the, the bed. Um, if we have the ri reinforcing ribs along the length, then we, we need to put them all one way so they fit between the ribs on the underside of the bed. Uh, we forgot one thing is the little little uh, thermistor. We need to poke a little hole in there or just attach a thermistor to this. I would insulate the bottom of the, this bed to, to prevent more heat loss. So do something like insulation, build a little structure to support insulation underneath. When you build the nichrome, that's a task that can be done between multiple teams if we were building that in one day. Uh, wrap it once, then wrap another layer of Kapton tape and then come back with the wires so the two wires come, come, to, come to one point so it's just easier for wire management as opposed to having the two different ends of this on opposite ends so it's easier to run the wires. So that's the heater side. And after that, we get the electronics. So, so the idea is that on a, on a ramps board, instead of plugging in the Pololu, small Pololu drivers, we can use a couple of those pins. We need like, only like two or so pins uh, that we plug into out of the, the stepper driver sockets and plug into this much larger driver. It's the Toshiba 6600 stepper driver. It does, does up to four, current, four, four amps of current. It can sustain up to eight of these small NEMA 17 motors. The TB6600 is low cost, it's like 10 bucks or so. You can of course get larger ones for scalability of that to more and more power if you like. But you can large, run a large number of the, the small stepper motors. So, so this would apply to the Z axis, definitely. We said we want to start with four stepper motors to get 80 pounds of upward lift on the, on the bed itself. 
on the X and Y axes, our first try would be to do exactly what we do with the 3D printer, because if we use the same print head, it weighs no, no more. It's the only, if you have much longer length, the only extra weight in there that you're actually needing to force uh, on the x-axis, it's just the extra belt. That's it. So there's literally like no difference. And on the, on the y-axis, the extra weight is the fact that you have instead of about 16 inches of rod, you now have 3 feet of rod. So there's a little bit of extra weight, but not too much. It's only maybe like a pound or so. So essentially, we think that on the first try, we could try the, the same stepper drivers, just, just leave it the same for the x-y-axis. If we find that we might need more strength, then we might add one of these external stepper drivers. So you'd have your, your driver board. Next to it, you would have this larger stepper driver, which gets its own current power source that plugs into your 12 volts or 24 volts. These actually go up to, I think, 36 volts. Uh, but you'd plug that in and, and connect your stepper wires into those terminals, and you can connect multiple stepper motors, uh, about eight, to each of those terminals. So that's the idea, just using a larger external stepper driver to get the larger force that you need. And we're still talking about using the very small stepper motors that we use right now. The other option, is, if we didn't want to use multiple stepper motors, is to use larger stepper motors. So NEMA 23 or 36, uh, just basically ones, they go, come to pretty large size. They get exponentially more expensive at that level. But it makes sense to do either NEMA 17 like we do right now or NEMA 23, which I would like to say twice the power, twice the torque maybe, or so depending on their variation. But then, then you can handle more, more force as you need. So that's the electronics. Um, and that's pretty much all the scalability considerations for, for a much larger 3D printer. You also have to lengthen the, the wire lengths. You have to make sure that uh, the wire lengths that we do have are as short as possible because you know the longer the wire length, the the longer the larger the resistance. So you have to consider that as another issue here. But with with one meter of length, not too much bigger than before, you're pretty much okay. So you can do this, scale this to a one meter cube. Uh, we have done it for a six foot tall 3D printer, still with an eight inch bed, where all the electronics are pretty much at the top. Uh, the wires are still very short because all the motors are at the top except for the heater bed which you have to the heat bed does need need a longer bed longer uh, wire to reach down to it if you've got six feet of length um, so in this system here the, the longest length for the one one cubic meter printer would still be the heater bed wire which will have to go all the way down to the bottom but everything else is pretty much all the other electronics are at the top, so it makes it quite easy to do. So, any questions on this? Um, theoretically, what would happen here? I mean, in principle, this should be uh, quite doable, and because of the, the part, the kinds of parts we use, it's it's easy to scale them up to different sizes because the design pattern remains the same. Scalability refers to using the same design patterns, but you might have to get tricky on some details like you have to you do have to understand some calculations like for example for the simply the bed weight to get an idea of how many motors you're going to need or how much current you're going to need to drive it up so there's basic calculations you want to do throughout and it would be good to do structural cal calculations for example within FreeCAD finite element method analysis which will show you for example if you're moving so fast you've got such a force what how much deflection of the actual metal structure would be needed, uh, would, would happen as a result of a certain amount of motion. That you can simulate within FreeCAD if you want to optimize the frame. Like right now we know that 8th inch from experience, 8th inch by 2 inch will be plenty. I don't, I don't see why that, that would not work. But you can do the test driven design part where you're doing simulations, calculations alongside of all the steps that you're doing in a build to to make sure your results are good or if you want to optimize for the lightest frame you'd know what the limits are and then of course you have to test it so a lot of times um, you know the the simulations are only as good as you know they might be thrown out because of some different effects that you see in reality reality is always the check you can't go on a theory you always have to check it 
So, but but there are insights for what's even possible using the the finite element method analysis within FreeCAD. Any questions? Sarah? Did you say at one point um, you mentioned having multiple extruders on this? Yeah, absolutely. And how, how would that work? How would they not run into each other? How would the software manage that? So there's different ways to do that. If they are all doing the same thing, then it's easy to use Say you want to put four extruders on this, or, or double it for now. Well, doubling, you can probably use the same ramps board and splice the wire into two from the controller board, the ramps board, into the two extruders. Uh, you would also have to detect the temperature of the nozzle, but you can make an assumption like, okay, I'm going to put a thermistor on one of the extruders, and that's only one. We're going to assume that because they're identical in principle and they're feeding the same wire, and they got the same electronics, you can assume that they're going to be the same. So you can sense from one. So you need one wire for the thermistor, let's say, two control wires, which are just spliced of the, off the original board. So you, you would do zero mo modification. Now, those two extruders would r ride on the same axis. They would do everything identically. So there is no variation there. Uh, the only consideration is get them level. Um, if you're on one axis, it's, it's relatively easy to align two of those. But that, of, of course, puts limits on your bed. Like your bed will have to be between that distance of those two extruders. That bed has to be level within the dimension of the print width, the, the size of the filament. So the more you have, the more flat your bed has to be between extruders, otherwise they would not really align, uh, that's the consideration there. So you want to start with a flat bed, and I think just a simple method of using uh, mild steel and the reinforcement on the back, that, that probably would do it for multiple printers. With two printers, no problem. You can go ahead and use the existing electronics. Ramps is also set up to run two, two extruders independently. Uh, that happens like right now, we took up one of the extruder drivers, we turned that into Y2, but normally the ramps board is designed to have one extruder, like two extruder outlets. We, can, we are using that extruder outlet for the Y2 axis because we have two Y axes, which is not common for the normal 3D printer world. So if you want to do more than two, then you're going to have to, depending how you do it, if they're all doing the same thing, you can still use the same trick, use ramps, and then use the Toshiba 6600 driver, connect up to eight extruders. You know? Now it's going to be hard to align them, harder, so you have to have an adjustment on each, but the same ramps with one external Toshiba driver can run up to eight heads, as long as they're doing the same thing. Now if you're, you're going to have all of them do different things, like one will do rubber and the other one would just throw in some nylon braiding into that and the third one will put in some very thin <coughs> wire for reinforcement into that print which we've never seen done yet I, have, I haven't seen that uh, but if you have multiple heads doing multiple things you need a different board than the ramps you're gonna have to scale up to a different board different software right now ramps supports two different extruders and Marlin firmware supports two different extruders so then you go to maybe different boards. There's many different boards out there that can handle more than two extruders. But in a typical use case of production, the very simple ramps get you these print farms. So uh, where you say printing like 12 two by four plastic lumber pieces on one bed, um, one simple ramps with an external uh, Toshiba driver, but maybe you do one that's larger than the Toshiba it still gets the two little signal outputs, so you get not TV6600, but a larger one. It can drive 12 or whatever, or however many you need, and you can still be doing uh, production work using the very, very simple low-cost board. So that's a, that's a use case of a very low-cost, high-performance system that can be created using the very common parts. <clears throat> Alex? Uh, she reminded me of my question earlier. You were yep. talking about multiple extruders. Uh, I have a dual extruder that's like the two nozzles are fixed together, yeah. and they, uh, the problem with that is like one will, say if you have two different colors, one will bleed into the other, and the, 
more recent things I've seen hit the market is where they have like two independent nozzles, mm -hmm. where one will move out and go to the side while the other one does one color and one one type of filament and material. And uh, right. I was wondering if you've ever thought about putting that into like designs of the, <coughs> the uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Is, Once again, as with uh, technological determinism, there's a hundred ways of doing different things. So yes, there. Are, for the purpose that you want, you can have different systems of how you're moving the heads around. You can land the, the print head. Actually, E3D is open sourcing this version of a quick exchange tool mount where the 3D printer, uh, it has four heads parked on a frame and then it goes up to one, it picks one up and it works with that. It drops it off, it picks up the next one, works with that. So you can have an infinite variety of combinations um, for whatever the purpose is that you want to do. For our case here, a lot of it might be around, say, production of materials for the CD go home. I, I think a lot about material production, in which case the very, very simple system of, of multiple heads doing the same thing do well. But then, of course, we also absolutely think of things like rubber plus nylon for rubber, uh, for nylon braided tires or metal braided tires or things like that. So you definitely want to have, for us, absolutely see a good need for two heads, but Marlin already takes care of that for two independent print heads. So, and then you can customize as you need to in Marlin and in the hardware. Um, yeah. I'm kind of curious about oh, why you seem to keep mentioning using printers to make like 2x4 type applications, when right. it seems like an injection molding setup would be more effective to produce strong materials like Oh, that. absolutely. But well, that's a question of spending at present, you know, fifty thousand dollars for that machine versus a five hundred dollar printer that can do the identical thing. So there's a there's a question of of multi-purpose. Now, of course, the three D printer is going to take you, uh, you know, a day. A three D printer with the Volcano nozzle does about five pounds of printing per twenty four hours. Uh -huh. So it'll take you that at very low energy. I mean, you can do that in a in a minute using a large extruder, but then you also have to have maybe like a 50 kilowatt power supply. It'll be a much different system. Yes, absolutely. If you're in production and you want to um, do what everyone else does or just common mainstream production, yes, you do that. But here we're, we're saying, how can you do more with less um, with the same infrastructure? How can you do different things? So for example, on um, printing a two by four, it's something where, uh, in, a, in practical terms, say you late, you know, you got your little print farm in your room and you just let that go overnight, for practical purposes, there's going to be no difference between you, you doing that with your own home printer versus doing that with a professional extruder that costs, say, a hundred times as much. Right. Um, as, because you can let that go overnight, you know, you click print, it saves you a trip to, to Menards or the hardware store. So... It's about what, how you want to design your life or production system. Point is that, yes, what you're talking about is the dedicated machine that does just that. I mean, it might have different nozzles for different shapes of profiles. Maybe it does also sheet and whatever. But that's where the multifunction capacity of a printer can address a lot of those needs. And maybe you can't do some other things. But for example, the twin wall polycarbonate glazing. How is that made right now? It's made by large, expensive machines that extrude your four-foot-wide piece of the you know, double-wall air pocket in between greenhouse glazing. Well, standing vertically up, you can do the identical with a 3D printer. Uh, to give you, show you an example, I've got a sample of that. Uh, you know, so this is a small thing printed on our uh, 3D printer, it's just an eight-inch one. Twin wall glazing, just like that. You can do this with an extruder, or you can do it with a 3D printer. This is just PLA, transparent PLA. But you can print that in polycarbonate and get a result that's similar to this million dollar machine on your home home printer. I so, have mostly because precious plastic is producing oh, yeah. beams with their extruder, so it's still a multi-purpose machine. Yeah, the way I think they did it, they're, I think they're doing an injection on that one. Nat? Yeah, like what they're doing is they're using that, well, no, they're not using that. They have another machine that melts the plastic scrap, and then in, you actually have a lever, and you squeeze that down into a form. Now, that you can only do so much, like a little mass at a time. 
So to make that practical, to make, for example, a, a real 2x4, which is 8 feet high, I mean, you'd be there all day doing that melting plastic, and you saw mm -hmm. how, how long it takes just to extrude the filament. Okay. So it's extremely inefficient, but you can do it. Now, they also took their extruder that they make filament with, and they, they made a, no a bigger nozzle yes. for it, and a tube, and they were squeezing it out that way. Too. Yes. They, so with, for example, the precious plastic extruder, yes, you can do that, but then... It only still has a one inch barrel and like I think maybe like 500 or 800 watts of heating there's only so much you can do with that yeah you can do that uh, so you can do a low brow version of extruding you know bigger profiles but it will go very slow mm. uh, so so once again depends on what your specs of the performance you would like and how you're treating your system in terms of a multi-purpose system versus a dedicated system because the idea is if you can do multiple things with just one printer, like we were talking about baking naan on your on your 3D printer, because the heat bed is actually a, a heater surface. You can bake eggs on it, you know? You, you can uh, cook your eggs on it, for example. So the idea there is simply, if you want to have a resilient infrastructure, I mean, depends what your goals are. If you're, you know, if you want to be highly resilient and have a lot of multi-purpose machines, well, you, you're also going to have to have higher skill level. Uh, so there's different ways of doing things, once again. So we're, we're basically developing a package just to show what's possible in terms of, say, any single community being able to generate the entire technology set of society. And this connects back to, to the political ideals or social, uh, sociological, sociology ideals of what this is. We are doing something with a certain purpose. The purpose is to say, can we absolutely get rid of war, corruption, poverty, things like that? Uh, can we get rid of any ill that's caused by material scarcity? So we're saying, okay, we're designing a small system that can be so powerful, so resilient and, and self-contained that it creates this new social or political possibility. So there's definitely a purpose behind the style of things we do. There's a certain goal to it. While with the mainstream system, it's to make as much as possible in the shortest time, not necessarily considering environment or wealth distribution or other issues that we'd like to consider here. So, so each technology is packaged with a set of conditions around it that make it the way it is for multiple purposes or goals. Yeah, but for us, I mean, if, if the same machine can do your glazing, your table, your structural lumber at 100% infill, which will take a lot of time, uh, your aquaponic fittings, plumbing fittings, well, that's really much better than having a multiple range of machines that do just one of them at a time. So you're talking about cost reductions on the order of hundreds or even thousands when you consider one lifetime, lifetime design, which is 10, 10 times lower, open source design, which is 10 times lower cost, then you get multi-purpose machines that do not one thing, but 10 things. So right there, you already have a thousand factor of efficiencies that you've gained through this, uh, what I would call appropriate technology system. So that's, that's a big issue to consider on the teleology, the goals of this program. Um, for the, the beam structures, have you thought about doing like a lattice structure so you minimize um, uh, material usage and oh, yeah. uh, optimize structure? Well, yeah, so that would be the percent infill of the of the 2 by 4 I mean, within Cura, you set the infill setting. Typically, the parts we print are 20% filled in. Most of it is air because you, you don't need that much strength in the parts that we use. So they're only 20% filled in. You can do that from 0 to 100% where at 100% you have very strong structures, uh, that's automatic through Cura. Is that what you were meaning, or something um, different? Kind of more along the lines of uh, SLA, like how they have to have like holes in the structure itself to let the uh, liquid drain. And, okay. And then, so yeah. it would be more like, um, like yeah. yeah. You can so, optimize, for example, like if you print your two by four, maybe it will be a total hole throughout, so maybe it lets moisture dribble down through the inside to, to the floor or whatever, you can do various things. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, the geometry is, has got, like, a lot of possibilities for what we can do with the 3D printing.
Yeah. yeah. Uh, any questions from the, the people in the remote? Remote setting? Go ahead, Zbinek. No, it's not built. We built one last year that was uh, six feet with an eight inch square bed, and we ran that. So that one we have. The eight, the, the one cubic meter printer, we were supposed to build that today, but we are so behind that we will save that for the rest of the immersion program, probably like in a week or two, where we build it with the, so there's seven people here that are staying for a full month to do the full immersion program. Now today is the last day we're out of the 18 people that were here, everyone's leaving after today. We didn't have time to do that yet. Okay, thanks. Yep.